Okay, team, we are back talking about the Kingdom Fungi, and we are in the division Basidio Mycota. We will discuss the human relevance of this division, as well as look at the life cycle of the organisms in the group. And um, we'll take it from there, see how far we can get. So uh, we looked at this slide in the last video, but it's worth taking a look at again. And uh, we'll begin discussing uh, some of the poisonous amanitas, uh, uh, some of the poisonous basidiomyces, rather, including this one right here, which is called amanita verosa. Uh, Amanita in Latin means angel, and verosa means fierce or deadly. Uh, this species is commonly, commonly referred to as the death angel or death cap. Uh, it is notoriously the most poisonous uh, mushroom in North America. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, the genus Amanita and uh, you know, what happens if you were to be unfortunate enough to ingest this thing? Well, what puts it in the genus Amanita are the presence of two things, the vulva, V-O-L-V-A, uh, not like the girly part, that's spelled with a, with a U. So in, in mushroom language, the vulva is spelled V-O-L-V-A. And the vulva is the swollen base that you can see here. Uh, this mushroom's been pulled up out of the ground. You can also see it coming up here. What actually happens is the cap of the mushroom, this part here, and the stem break out of this vulva. And so if you looked at a picture of this mushroom before it had gotten this far along, it would, it would be sort of shaped like that. And then over time, the mushroom kind of erupts out of it like this. So, um, look for the presence of a vulva, and that is one of the distinctive features of the genus Amanita. The other is this piece of tissue right here on the stem, and this is commonly called the hymenium, or universal veil. Uh, they're the same thing, and it's this little flap of tissue along the stem. If you come across a species of mushroom that has both a vulva and a universal veil, uh, you can safely put it into the genus Amanita. Uh, as far as this mushroom goes, it's quite common. It will come up in, in woodlands or uh, marginal uh, edges of woodlands and even perhaps in your lawn. I've, I've seen it numerous times in lawns. Uh, the species is pure white. And just to give you an idea of how you know, deadly toxic this thing is, uh, we measure toxicity, one of the ways we can measure it is by the LD50. The LD50 is, the LD stands for lethal dose, and the 50 stands for, is a percentage, so 50% of the time. In other words, what's the lethal dose if someone consumed it uh, half the time they're gonna die? Uh, and for this mushroom, it's about two grams wet weight. To give you an idea, it's probably like the end of your thumb worth of flesh. And uh, if you consume this amount, there's a 50% chance you're going to die. So it would make sense if you consume twice that or four grams, then uh, there's not much that can be done for you. Uh, the chemical toxins are very interesting. Uh, they're cyclic octopeptides. Let's break this down. We know about chemistry, right? We know about organic compounds. Octa is eight. Peptides are what we use to, um, what we use uh, to describe uh, amino, uh, proteins, right? And so if we have eight amino acids stuck together and they're, it's cyclic, See if I can draw this. There's one amino acid, two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight. So it forms this sort of ring of amino acids that are, there's eight different amino acids in there. These cyclic octopeptides are incredibly toxic to the body. 
the, your, your body doesn't make the enzyme to cut these bonds here. And so what happens is this thing is just small enough to be absorbed into the bloodstream where it then embeds itself in the kidneys and the liver. And so typical um, prognosis or symptoms for this species and then you know, outcome, um, typically for the first 12 to 24 hours, there's, there are no symptoms. The, the, the patient, uh, in, if they didn't realize that they'd eaten it, probably wouldn't have any way of knowing. Uh, the following 12 to 24 hours, the patient would become violently ill, uh, pooping and vomiting blood. Uh, and I don't know about you, but if I'm pooping and vomiting blood, where am I going? Most likely to the ER, right? At that point, uh, you know, there again, maybe they knew that they had ingested a mushroom and maybe they didn't. And if they did know, then of course the doctors would try to figure out what mushroom they had ingested. Um, but honestly, once this stage occurs, there's little that modern science can do uh, to save you. Uh, what's interesting is after that second 24 hour period, a lot of times the, the patient goes into remission. In other words, the symptoms kind of remiss and go away. And um, patient starts to feel feel better and to the point where a lot of times they'll discharge them from the hospital. And then ultimately these individuals have simultaneous kidney and liver failure. So they go down pretty quick after that. Uh, so, you know, because this mushroom is so common, it accounts for most of the mushroom fatalities in North America. The take home message is don't put in your mouth what you don't know what it is, right? So if you're interested in harvesting wild mushrooms, you want to be super duper careful. And you would certainly want to know the deadly ones, uh, you know, be able to identify the deadly ones along with the edible ones so that you didn't make that fatal mistake. Uh, most recent case I heard of uh, ingestion of Amanita virosa uh, close by was um, some uh, kids that were collecting psilocybin mushrooms in the Piedmont of North Carolina. And uh, apparently one of these ended up in the basket and one of the poor girls ate the Amanita mushroom instead of the psilocybin mushrooms that they were collecting. And um, she actually did survive. She, her father, they did emergency liver transplant. Her father donated a lobe of his liver to his daughter. Uh, unfortunately, she will be on dialysis for the rest of her life. So again, you have to be really exceedingly careful with, with this kingdom of organisms, but just because there are a few that are deadly poisonous. Uh, I often tell my students, if you picked 10 mushrooms and 10 plants and you, you had to decide which ones to eat, you're probably better off eating the plants. You might get a bellyache with the mushrooms, you could die. Okay, so that's a good one to know. The next one is interesting uh, as well. Fascinating, really. It's also in, I just realized I didn't have this zoomed, but that might be okay. Uh, that way, if I make the, the faux pas of accidentally switching the slide, it's easy to switch it back. <laughs> so this one you'll see is also in the, in the genus Amanita. This one is called Amanita muscaria. And Amanita muscaria is commonly called fly agaric. And here's some interesting things about this species. It has been used throughout the entire world as a psychoactive drug. Uh, it has been consumed all over the world. If there was a world map and you put dots everywhere this thing had been used as a psychoactive drug, there would literally be dots all over the world. Uh, but most notably in Lapland and Siberia, uh, this was the sacred mushroom of the Laplanders. These were reindeer herders. And believe it or not, in case you didn't know, uh, the legend of Santa Claus predates Christianity by about 3,000 years. Okay, Santa's been around for 3,000 years longer than Jesus. And the legend of these people was that their, their religious belief was that of the world tree. So much of the imagery that you think of and associate with Christmas, with Christmas, which is considered a Christian holiday now, actually was kind of taken from uh, these, these people. 
of the Russian steppes. So they believed in the world tree, hence the Christmas tree as the symbol. And what they believed was that the roots of the tree were the past and the trunk of the tree was the present and the top of the tree was the future. And so past, present and future. Now, if you're a nomadic reindeer herder, what would the star be on the top of the tree? What would, would that represent? What would be the sacred star of the nomad? The North Star, right? Because it doesn't move in the sky. It stays in the same location. Uh, so now here's where it gets crazy. These particular species are symbiotic on, uh, or saprobic on, uh, on, uh, on fir trees. And, and these fir trees would be about the only kind of tree that would grow in Siberia. And so at certain times of the year, typically in the spring, uh, these mushrooms would pop up out of the ground underneath the tree. And they believed these mushrooms were the fruit of the gods. Uh, the tinsel that you put on your Christmas tree actually represents the semen of the gods. And they, they thought that, you know, when the dew landed on the tree, which is what the tinsel represents, it's what triggered the formation of these, uh, of these fruiting bodies underneath the tree. So now the other thing that they realized was that if you ingest these mushrooms, uh, they're very toxic. They're toxic to the liver. And what they figured out was they could feed them to reindeer. Yes, that's right, flying reindeer. So they would feed these to reindeer and then they would capture the urine of the reindeer or I'm guessing probably just eat the yellow snow of the reindeer. And what would happen is the psychoactive alkaloids would pass into the urine and out and the toxins would stay in the liver of the reindeer. And you could imagine a reindeer has a bigger liver than we do. So the way it went was the shamans would eat the yellow snow and then they would collect their urine and pass it down through the community. And so uh, apparently these chemical alkaloids can pass through five or six uh, passes of a mammal and still be psychoactive. So you could just imagine what that must have been like drinking your, each other's urine. <laughs> kind of wacky. So, but let's think about Santa. Santa was, Santa Claus is a super shaman, right? Think about this mushroom as it relates to Santa's outfit. Now it is important to note that our current version of Santa was created by the Coca-Cola company in the 19, early 1900s. Uh, but, you know, they got their version from, um, from, you know, all the way back to the legends of these uh, people that lived in Siberia. Now, Flying reindeer and gifts, you know, the gifts obviously would have been the, the mushroom. It was considered sacred. Uh, and, you know, the reindeer probably did fly when they ate this species. Now, I'm going to tell you, th these are not the psilocybin mushrooms, the magic mushrooms that make you giggle. Uh, you really got to get high if, you, if you're going to eat these or, or got to want to get high, let's say. Uh, the first hour or so, you're in a semi-comatose stupor and you're probably drooling on yourself. And then from there, it progresses into, you know, an intense psychoactive trip that can last 12 or 18 hours, depending on how much you consume. Unfortunately, uh, all mammals are susceptible to the species. And there have been cases where dogs have actually accidentally ingested Amidina muscaria and they've gone into this comatose state and their, their owners not knowing what's wrong, take them to the vet. The vet says, oh, they must have had a stroke and actually puts the dog to sleep, puts it down, uh, when really if they would have just waited a few more hours, the dog would have come out of its stupor. So, uh, you know, something to think about. Uh, we do have the species in Eastern North America. It is a yellow capped variety. We don't have the, the bright red capped variety and our species, is considerably more toxic than the Western species. Uh, because there's not much interest in use, uh, this is not a regulated species of mushroom. In other words, it's not illegal to, uh, to grow or to purchase. Um, so that, that's the fly agaric. And you've seen this imagery in, in what? Um, Alice in Wonderland. It's the Mario mushroom, right? So you've seen this mushroom before because of its rich history and ethnobotany. Okay. Let me clear all those and we'll go to the next slide. Now we'll kind of roll through. Um, I 
and roll through the. So now we're getting into uh, shelf fungi or polypores, as they're called. These typically will only be found growing on standing wood, um, like uh, dead trees or, or even living trees. This particular one is worth mentioning because it's called chicken of the woods. And La Portilla is this bright orange color and it is often um, collected as an edible. Uh, and it's considered one of the safe seven that you can collect and eat, although there are a few, um, you know, things you might confuse it with. Uh, but it would be pretty easy uh, to do a little research and be able to collect this one. It's going to fruit in the summer. And if you break off these tender little edges here, they call it chicken of the woods because it really does taste like chicken. Now, here's an interesting thing uh, that's worth mentioning. Anytime you're going to eat an edible wild mushroom for the first time. You want to eat a very small amount and you want to wait about 30 minutes just to make sure that you're not going to react negatively to it. This particular species is one that we call a partial. By partial, we mean it's par partially edible to the general population. I am one of the 1% that gets sick from this species. If I eat it, I vomit. 99% of the rest of us can eat it, or the rest of you can eat it, and no, no problem. So one in a hundred vomits. Uh, I've sold this many times to chefs, and I'm, I always tell them, you realize the hundredth person that eats this is gonna vomit, and they're like, we don't care, it's so good. <laughs> so, you know, take home message, even if it's edible. Well, first time eating it, eat a little bit. Okay, so check it out. So that's a good one to know. And now we have, ah, the genus Psilocybe. So this is a pretty notorious one, right? This has also been used all over the world as a hallucinogenic drug, particularly in tropical and subtropical areas. Uh, this was considered, you know, the sacrament of uh, many Native American tribes in Central and South America. And what you're looking at here, um, this is a indoor grow of Psilocybe cubensis. Cubensis is the most commonly grown or cultivated and also the most commonly collected Psilocybe species that's used uh, as a psychoactive drug. It contains the uh, serotonin analog called psilocybin. Now, what you're looking at here, this looks to be a, uh, a brown rice and vermiculite cake. And so if you mix one-to-one -one brown rice and vermiculite together, um, and then you pack it in a mason jar and sterilize it, uh, then you could actually inject some spores into it and let the mycelium grow and colonize it. And then once it's fully colonized, if you open it up in response to the fresh air, it will typically make these fruiting bodies, which are the mushrooms. Now, here's the thing. The spores of, of psilocybin mushrooms are legal to buy and sell. You can buy and sell them because there's no psilocybin in them. And you could go online right now and there'll be 500 different places that are, that'll mail you a sterile syringe of psilocybin spores. But as soon as you squirt those spores onto a growing medium and the spores germinate and start to grow mycelium, the mycelium contains psilocybin. At that point, you've broken Oh, several laws, including manufacturing a scheduled substance. Okay, so be aware, it becomes illegal very quickly. It used to be that only the fruiting bodies, the mushrooms themselves were illegal. And so what people were doing is just growing the mycelium on grain and eating the grain and you could get just as high doing that. So uh, the man said, well, no, you can't do that either. So now only the spores are legal. Okay. Uh, and the other thing I'll point out is there are other species of psilocybe. Psilocybe cubensis is considered medium strength, and that's 90, probably 90% 90 of the time what people are, are selling on the street. But now there's a new species that's become popular, and it's worth mentioning, uh, and we'll, we'll say why. There's another species, um, 
And it has a wavy cap. And this wavy cap species, although it's sold as a psilocybin mushroom, is a hundred times more potent. And so what's been happening lately is, you know, you go to your friendly neighborhood drug dealer and you buy a bag of psilocybin mushrooms like maybe you've done before and you eat a gram or two, which would be a dose. Well, it happens to be this other species. And uh, what then happens is you've just now eaten a hundred times more than you normally eat and you probably end up at the ER thinking you're gonna die. <laughs> okay, so you wanna, you wanna be aware there are other species of this mushroom that can be much more potent than uh, the more common psilocybin. All right, takes care of that. And on to the next. Oh my goodness, well, here's a stink horn. Uh, and you can see um, it is of the genus Phallus, which is pretty appropriate. It's very phallic when it comes out of the ground, at least this particular species. Uh, and uh, this one I've seen in books at, uh, referred to as the dog stinkhorn or the dog penis stinkhorn. I know it's kind of gross, but that's actually what some authors are calling it as a common name. Uh, what you have with the stinkhorn is a fruiting body that smells of rotting meat. It smells so nasty, you can smell them a mile away. And rather than having their spores airborne, you can see this is a mass of spores here that's very sticky. We say it's viscid spore mass. And so what's the strategy of this species? Well, the strategy is to attract flies and other insects that like decomposing things. And the flies are walking all over this thing and they're getting the little spores stuck on their legs and off they fly and wherever the fly goes, it transmits the spores. So it's just a different strategy to move your spores around uh, and there are, lots of amazing species. Do yourself a favor and just uh, do a, a quick Google search of stinkhorns. Heck, let's do it right now. Let's, let's look at some stinkhorns just for fun. Um, Got to be careful what you search online, I tell you. I'm going to say stinkhorn mushroom just to be careful that I don't get anything vulgar. I might still get some vulgar stuff. Uh, there you can see all of the diversity. Look at this thing. Uh, now, you know, if I click on it, it may or may not pop up. I don't know. But the, let's look at, let's try and look at the lace stink horn. That's Wikipedia, it should pop up. Uh, come on, baby, look at that. Look how beautiful that is. I mean, aside from smelling like rotting meat, it's a really cool looking mushroom, huh? Amazing. And then uh, there's uh, there's this one, which looks all the world like some kind of sea creature. I mean, it's just, it's just nasty. It says the stinkhorn mushroom may be the nat grossest thing on earth. Well, I wouldn't argue. Where is it though? There's a, there's a, now you can see on this one, all the flies attract it, which is cool to see. And then where's that other one? Oh, they don't have it in there. That's weird. Oh, here it is. Here it is blooming. Look, check it out. Pretty freaky, huh? Look at that thing. Oh, okay. That's like nightmarish. All right. So there you have it. Those are the stink horns. Now, what about this crazy thing? This is a giant puffball, and the puffballs are um, are edible if they're pure white on the inside and smooth skinned. There are some poisonous ones, and you want to be careful. I've, although they're edible, eh, I've never had a good puffball. They just kind of turn to slime when you cook them, and I just I don't I don't understand them. But some people swear by them. They'll take a, a one like that and make like some brontosaurus steaks out of it. <laughs> Big thick puffball steaks and put them on the grill. Okay. Uh, Berkeley, California, where these things grow out in California, 
was curious, you know, how many spores are inside of this thing? Because this thing is a spore producing body. Well, they met, they weighed it, you know, and then they took a very tiny fraction of the spores and they counted them. And what they discovered was this thing has about 80 trillion spores. Oh my goodness. And the implications of this, if every one of these puffballs, if, if every one of these 80 trillion spores made another puffball this size, it would be half the mass of the earth. So luckily, most of these don't ever make it, right? But that gives you kind of an idea of this group. Okay. And that brings us into the deuteromycota. So what we have left, um, we'll talk about the deuteromycetes next time. We'll have one more short video. And that video will cover the deuteromycota and it'll cover the symbiotic relationships. But what we want to do now is we want to look at the life cycle of the basidiomycota. So we're going to do a little quick chalk and talk. And I'm going to draw this life cycle out for you. And um, See what you think, because it's a wacky one, okay? So we start out with mating strains. The mating strains end up being a little bit more complicated. So I'm gonna draw them in different colors, like I did before. And so here come these two filaments of opposite mating strains. Uh, well, you know, we'll just say that the colors represent the different mating strains. There are more than just plus and minus a lot of times in different uh, species of basidiomycetes. What are we doing here? This is the basidiomycota life cycle. Okay. <clears throat> so what happens next is curious. We have when two appropriate mating strains come together. Now, if you remember in the zygomycota, Walls formed here, and these first cells became zygotes, uh, and they fused, or, or became um, gametes, and they fused to form a zygospore. Well, look what happens here. This is a very strange, strange phenomenon that occurs. What happens is the two filaments come together and form basically a new structure. And the nuclei pair up, but they don't fuse. And that's the really kind of bizarre thing about it. Oops, I was supposed to get black there. So there's the other strain. You can see all the nuclei are paired up. Okay. And so this thing, this filament now, this is one end and one end, right? The, the fungal filaments are haploid. They have one set of chromosomes. They're haploid organisms in their vegetative state. What about this new thing? Well, it's not really haploid and it's not really diploid. The nuclei have paired up, but they haven't fused. We're going to call this dikaryotic. Dikaryotic hyphae. Just a wacky, wacky thing that you'll only see in the basidiomycota. Dikaryotic, two nuclei. That's what carrion refers to the nucleus. So two nuclei paired up. So if we step back and we think about a mushroom, the only way you can get a mushroom is if you first have the formation of this dikaryon, this dikaryotic hyphae. So if we step back and think about it in the sort of macro view, what a mushroom consists of is the two mating strains put together. So here's this mating strain from this side and this one from this side. And the mushroom is made of the dikaryotic hyphen, like this. Okay, so we have both strains making up the mushroom. Okay, so we still don't have fusion and we still don't have meiosis. We need to see both of those things. If you took it, if you looked at a single gill, we say one gill, what you would see is that at the ends of the gills, and I'm just gonna do the nuclei different colors just for my own sanity. 
at the ends of the gills, all over each gill, and imagine the surface area that the gills have, a tremendous amount of surface area is the whole point of the, having gills on the underneath side, right? So what will then happen is a wall will finally form here between these end two nuclei like this. And then you can bet what's gonna happen is fusion, right? So the next picture is gonna look like this. And we have the coming together of those two nuclei. And what are we going to call this first cell? We're going to call it the zygote, right? Because that's what it is. So fusion forms the zygote. Now we're diploid. The next thing that's going to happen is meiosis. And when meiosis happens, what we see is the formation of the basidium, which is this club-like structure like this. And what we're going to get after meiosis is four spores, right? Two of each mating strain. Like this. And we're going to call this a basidium. And then the last picture we might draw, oops is these, these cells, these, these spores, will then migrate to the edge like this. And so we're gonna call these, this is the basidium, and we're gonna call these basidiospores. <laughs> B-A-S-I-D-I-O spores. And there's four of them, products of meiosis, right? So then we made four basidiospores. And you might think, well, big whoop, we made four spores. But guess what happens? These spores fly away in the wind. Off they go puff of wind. Now this empty basidium just kind of sloughs off and then the next two nuclei fuse and then the next two and then the next two and then the next two and on down the line. So the capability of making spores is tr tremendous in these organisms when you consider the, sur the surface area of all those gills and how these basidia are forming all over. So we have fusion zygote meiosis. It makes it the zygotic life cycle, right? And the big weird thing is the formation of this dikaryotic hyphae. And of course, you know, these spores germinate to grow into new haploid filaments, right? Think about the ploidy. What's the ploidy of the zygote? Always diploid. What's the ploidy? Uh, and we could, we could call these gametes now because they're going to fuse, right? Haploid. Uh, and I should draw it like that, so you know it's fusing. And then what's the ploidy of the basidiospores? One end, right? They're the products of meiosis. Anytime you have product of meiosis, it's going to be haploid. How do you get from diploid to haploid? Do meiosis. How do you get from haploid to diploid? Do fusion, right? This is something you've already seen in the other life cycles. So. Anything that makes a basidium with four basidiospores, we put it in the basidium mycota. Okay. Beautiful. Well, I think we're going to stop there and we'll have one more video to talk about deuteromycota and then we'll talk about mycorrhizae, which is very important. And we'll talk about. Um, things on the fringe, and, uh, and uh, we'll talk about lichens as well, okay? I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. I hope you learned something. Have an awesome day, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.